Welcome to Macro Musings, the podcast series where each week we pull back the curtain and take a closer look at the important macroeconomic issues of the past, present, and future. I'm your host, David Beckworth of the Mercatus Center. We are glad you've decided to join us. Our guest today is Lars Christensen. Lars is an internationally renowned Danish economist who specializes in international finance, emerging markets, and monetary policy. Lars has over 20 years' experience in government and banking and is the founder of Markets and Money Advisory and is a senior fellow at London's Adam Smith Institute. Lars worked five years as an economic policy analyst at the Danish government in the Ministry of Economic Affairs and spent many years as the head of emerging market research at the Danske Bank in Copenhagen. Lars also blogs at marketmonitors.com. Lars, welcome to the show. Thank you, David. Lars, I want to begin by asking what is market monetarism? Now, some listeners may know that may seem like a silly question coming from me because I have been labeled a market monetarist, but I want you to spell out for us what is a market monetarist and, and how is that different than a regular monetarist? I think that one thing is, is important to people like like uh, you and, and me and, and indeed uh, some of our friends uh, in the blogosphere is that we think of mo- money as being uh, at the center of uh, both what is happening on the nominal side of the economy, but also on the real side of the economy in the short term. Mm-hmm. So not only will money, uh, the demand and the supply for money determine inflation, nominal demand in the economy, but also uh, be the main cause of uh, fluctuation and economic activity, the cause of recession. Uh, and that, of course, we have in common with, with what, say, regular monetarists of the uh, of the traditional school of, of Milton Friedman. Mm-hmm. But also, we emphasize that market is at the core of understanding whether market, uh, whether monetary policy is easy or tight. Uh, we tend to like to look at uh, markets to tell us uh, what is happening with money demand and money supply. Uh, so let me, let me give you an example. Uh, if, if, if we have more demand for money than we have supply of money, monetary policy is tight. What should, what should happen in a situation where money is tight? But in the case of the U.S., for example, the dollar should strengthen. We know that. Uh, tighter monetary policy is also associated with uh, declining stock markets. So we go out and observe that the dollar is strengthening and the stock market declines. If we at the same time see market expectations for inflation decline, it's a pretty good indication that markets are telling us that monetary policy is coming too tight. Of course, this is, is very closely linked with uh, rational expectation theory that market uh, players, consumers, labor unions, investors are forward-looking individuals. That also means that we would not only look at what happens, for example, to the money base today, but what is the expectation for the money base tomorrow and be in, in 10 years? Uh, and, and that, I think, is, is, the, is the new development relative to, let's say, old school monetarism. I think that, that, that the old school monetarism, as, 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 uh, as Milton Friedman, of course, knew uh, that expectations were important, but they, they never emphasized it as much as we do uh, among market monetarists. Yes, I think a good example of that would have been in 2008, where we would look back and say, look, the break-evens, the expected inflation coming from the bond market was screaming, falling inflation ahead, right? They they knew something bad was happening, but the Fed was focused on headline inflation, which was going up. And so the market side would say, hey, look at these market signals in real time. And uh, that may have caused the Fed to have acted differently in 2008. Yes, absolutely. I think 2008, of course, is a very key example that we could see something, uh, something really significant happening just from looking at the market. Uh, market expectations were clearly telling us that, that there was less supply of money and there was demand for money. Uh, and that was very visible in the market. Uh, and, 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 uh, and observing that, you could see that monetary conditions became very tight and indeed was the main cause of the great uh, recession of 2008. Yes. It's interesting how this you know, market monetarism has emerged kind of, you know, naturally or spontaneously. So, like, we didn't know each other. I didn't know Scott. But the technology that connected us, blogging, 
Um, it, it's been fun to watch and see have uh, different groups of people been able to kind of emerge to, to find their tribe, so to speak. Um, so it's been a great journey for me, at least, uh, meeting people like you, Scott Sumner, and others. Um, let's let's now move to your areas of expertise. You're an international economist, and you're in Europe. So one of the, the persistent problems it seems over the past few years has been the eurozone crisis, and I yeah. think I think at the heart of it is this question as to whether the eurozone eurozone is an optimal currency area. So help us understand what is this optimal currency area criteria, and how does it kind of fit in with the whole eurozone crisis story? I think that if we go back to uh, optimal currency area theory, we, we of course have to go to uh, to Robert Mundell, the, mm-hmm. the, the the man behind the thinking of this, of course, the Nobel laureate, uh, who, who in many ways is said to be the father of the eurozone. It's it's a bit paradoxical that Bob Mundell is said to be the father of the eurozone. Indeed, he is a big fan of the eurozone, but his theory was also that if you want to build uh, uh, a currency area, the, 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 the countries participating in the monetary union should be relatively similar, and mostly they should be similar uh, in terms of, you can say, the supply side of the economy. They, the level of productivity should be more or less the same, and very importantly, the shock that hit the economy should be the same. So uh, that would also mean, essentially, we're assuming that one size fits all, so if we have a shock to uh, to one economy, uh, you should expect the same shock to hit uh, the the other economies. And indeed, that has not been the case in Europe, where we have hugely divergent economic development in the past uh, six seven years. In in Europe, essentially, if you look at, at Germany, Germany uh, is out of the crisis uh, uh, more or less. Uh, if you look at the real GDP uh, back on the pre-crisis trend, unemployment down to 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 more or less full employment, and the same goes for for other Eurozone countries. And then on the other hand, we have countries like Greece, Spain, Portugal, uh, which continue to suffer real, real uh, deep crisis. And, and we have seen in, in recent months, actually, that growth is faltering once again hmm. in, in these, these countries. So you can say, now in a situation where we still have a significant need for monetary easing in countries like Spain or Portugal or Greece, while Germany might need uh, tighter monetary conditions. I'm not entirely sure that they would need a not tighter, but, but there is clearly a divergence in what kind of monetary policy they need. And therefore, it's pretty obvious. It's not an optimal currency area. That, that being said, mm-hmm. I do also believe that monetary policy mistake adds to the problems if you, if you don't have an optimal currency area. Okay. So I think there are two dimensions in the Eurozone. One thing is that this is not an optimal currency area. Another thing is simply that monetary policy has been bad. It has been, in yeah. fact, horrendously bad, particularly on the former C, the ECB boss, uh, uh, Trichet. Yeah, as critical as we've been of Fed policy in 2008, 2009, they didn't raise interest rates while the ECB did raise interest rates, which just it blows one's mind. And then in 2011, they raised it twice. Um, so the Eurozone, correct me if I'm wrong, the Eurozone has gone through something as severe as the Great Depression in the 1930s. Is that right? Oh, yeah. I think that uh, Brad Long expressed it very well, saying that this is a longer depression. Uh, it, it's not only the longer, it's the longer and the deeper depression. If you look at a country like Finland, a Finland mm-hmm. that is, is doing all the right things, if you if you listen to the Eurocrats, uh, oh, you should do structural reforms, you should have fiscal conservative policies, things that, that both you and I normally uh, are, are supportive of, of, but would also say that they can do very little in, in a monetary-induced uh, 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 recession. Uh, Finland has been, in general, been following the rules. Uh, but despite of that, Finland really haven't seen any growth since 2007. And, and, and both real and nominal GDP today is lower than it was in 2007 in Finland. Uh, if we compare the situation in Finland, this crisis is worse than, than the, the Great Depression was for Finland, and it's mm. indeed worse than, than the, the rather horrific Nordic banking crisis in the 90s, where Sweden, uh, Norway, and Finland suffer from, from deep uh, and prolonged recession. Uh, and and, and uh, so, so, so Finland is doing... Uh, 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 quite bad. Take a country like Italy, essentially haven't grown for a decade, uh, and Greece, of course, being, being the, the, the worst of them all, really, really in a, in a, in a massive 
not only economic depression, but also serious social social crisis. Scott Sumner has said the Achilles heel of the right is monetary policy. And I think, you know, what you've, you've written, what you've said about the Eurozone is you see that happening, right? The rise of nationalism there, to some extent, is tied to the effectively tight monetary policy in parts of Europe. Is that right? Yes, I, I, I think that uh, it, 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 it's a bit of a horror show to watch, particularly for huh. those of us interested in, 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 in economic history mm-hmm. and particularly monetary history. And, and, and the way the crisis in Europe plays out, much more so than in the U.S., uh, is, is eerie in, in the sense how much is similar to what played out in, in, in during the Great Depression. So if we go back to the Great Depression, uh, Europe and the U.S. started out similarly uh, with the same shock. But then in, 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 in 32, 33, we got real bad, uh, a, a second round effects of a, a monetary crisis in Europe, uh, particularly uh, with with the collapse of of uh, Austria, sorry, the Kreditanstalt in, in in Austria and the Austrian German banking crisis that spread, and and at that time you had a gold standard, and uh, across the board in Europe, uh, countries refused to give up the gold standard. Uh, there was a gold standard mentality, as, as some has suggested to, to name it. This was at the core of economic policy. You could not leave the gold standard, and. Uh, and, and very much the same thing in the euro. Uh, the euro is being hold up as this sacred thing that uh, dictates everything else, no matter the consequences for the economy. And as that was developing an economic crisis, even and social crisis, even uh, we saw uh, a general loss of confidence in democracy across Europe in the nineteen thirties. Of course, uh, the horror for education in terms of the rise of Hitler. Uh, Mussolini in Italy, uh, and 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 so the the uh, the social fabric and the political consequence of that was very clear, and I think we are seeing something very very similar uh, today. We are seeing right now we are seeing uh, a debate in Britain about Britain leaving the EU. One can be uh, positive or negative on the EU, but a lot of the debate about what is called Brexit is not really about the economic. Of, of being inside of outside of the euro, it's actually turned into be a debate about immigration. Should we allow immigration into Britain from from countries like Poland, Lithuania, and Romania? Uh, very similar to the debate we have in the U.S. Uh, from 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 Donald Trump uh, and, and and his anti-immigration rhetoric. Uh, the, the rise of anti-immigration sentiment, in my view, is very very closely connected with the the uh, the uh, the fading trust in the political system to solve the economic crisis. Uh, obviously, uh, it, I believe that the crisis has been misdiagnosed by the popular masses, so to speak, uh, being a crisis of democracy rather than a crisis of, of, of monetary policy. But, but, but I think it's very clear that we're seeing that. We're seeing now, in countries like Greece, we have seen the rise of Golden Dawn, a new Nazi party. We have Jopik in Hungary, also a new fascist new Nazi party. And recently in Slovakia, uh, uniform Nazis coming into the Slovak parliament. So we have three or four parliaments in Europe where actually have forms wearing uniforms in parliament. And it's, it's just eerie how much similar that is to the 1930s. Um, I have written about, uh, for example, the, uh, the support for uh, Front National in France, uh, the party of Marie Le Pen, mm-hmm. uh, the ultra right wing anti immigrant party. Uh, if you look at the uh, recent regional elections, it was very clear that the, the support for uh, uh, Front National was particularly high in areas in France with high unemployment. So there's a clear connection between lack of economic performance and and support for these extremist groups, both on the left and on the right. Uh, so 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 what we're seeing is the second or third round effect of monetary policy area being uh, uh, the rise of nationalism, anti-immigration issues, and indeed interventionist economic policies. We are also seeing that in the U.S. to some extent. Just the, the, the wave of increases in, uh, in minimum wages in states around the U.S. and calls for, 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 for economic policies that clearly is damaging long-term economic growth. So the first round of the crisis is, is the monetary policy failure. But then the, as the crisis has deepened and we haven't gotten out of it, uh, and particularly because wage growth has been so, so meager also in the U.S., 
uh, you're seeing an increased tendency to support parties on the left and the right supporting interventionist economic uh, ideas that then lead to more supply side problems. And I think that that's actually where we are now. The supply side policy that is a direct consequence of the rise of populism is beginning to, to have a negative impact on growth. You know, if you look back at, in, at history, and, and I, I went back and was, was looking at the um, 1920s, 1930s in Germany, you mentioned Hitler. I was surprised yeah. to learn that a number of historians point to the Great Depression um, for the rise of Adolf Hitler, right? So we, we typically kind of kind of the I don't know the casual interpretation of what went wrong in Germany. It was hyperinflation, right? That that led, yes. led. But but a more careful look actually points to the Great Depression, which was the other way. It was too tight monetary policy caused by the gold standard. And and some of these historians have you know, carefully documented that, that as unemployment went up in Germany during this time of the Great Depression, so did the number of seats in Parliament that the Germans had. And and then Hitler's rise to power is closely tied to that. So I think Barry Eichengreen and, and um, some Peter Timmon, I believe they have a, a piece yeah. where they, they argue, you know, what would have happened had, you know, the gold standard been dropped earlier, if monetary policy had been different during the 19, late 20s, early 30s. And they argue, you know, World War II could have been avoided. You know, it's, it's, it's hard to know for sure because it's counterfactual, but they really underscored the importance that the uh, – the messed up gold interwar gold standard had on uh, the nat- rise of nationalism and ultimately war in Europe during that time. Now I want to go back to um, again back to the comments you're making earlier about you know the lack of Euro- Europe or the eurozone being an optimal currency area. Um, something that s- struck me, you know, when the eurozone was first formed, late 1999, when the euro was actually the first euro notes were introduced, Germany was growing relatively slow. Um, Ireland, yeah. on the other hand, was just red hot, right? It was this, this, the, the tiger. It was high tech, boom place. Um, so you, you look at the ECB. It comes into being, and now suddenly it's in this dilemma, right? It has to set monetary policy, and who do you set monetary policy for? Do you set it for Germany, which is growing maybe two percent a year, or for Ireland, which is growing ten percent a year? And no matter what you do, you're going to mess up, right? If you cater yeah. towards Germany, you're going to be way too you know, stimulative for Ireland. If you you try to slow Ireland down, you're going to crush Germany. And so you're stuck in a bind. And my question is, what ultimately did they do? Did they do a policy that was more favorable to Germany? Or do you think just the average of, of the Eurozone overall? Well, I, uh, you know, let me tell a story. Uh, uh, back in October, I, 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 I did a lecture at, at the Dallas Federal Reserve. Uh-huh. Um, so October 2015. Um, you know, uh, my big hero is uh, Milton Friedman. Uh, he's one of your big heroes as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Milton Friedman, exactly 10 years prior to my lecture at the, the Dallas Fed, uh, did a lecture at the Dallas Fed. Um, so I went back and uh, looked at what Milton Friedman was saying at that lecture because we were talking about a similar topic, uh, globalization, uh, international economics. And uh, Milton Friedman was actually asked about Germany, and this is so. This is go back to to 2005. Um, uh, and and interestingly, Friedman noted notes in, in in his presentation the sick child of Europe at that time being Germany. Hmm. And uh, uh, Friedman highlights two factors about Germany. He says, you know, on, on the one hand, Germany has terrible structural problems. It's a, the supply side issue. It's a rigid uh, labor market, uh, uh, very high and generous uh, welfare benefits, uh, very strong unions, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And then you have a monetary policy problem that really goes back to German reunification, that monetary policy has become too tight in Germany. So so early early 2000s, uh, uh, Germany was in, in not growing strongly and wasn't the sick child of Europe. And while we had these booming economies, we had Spain, we had Italy, we had Portugal, and indeed Greece were growing very strongly. And you can say the monetary policy, in fact, was, was way too easy for, uh, for, for these countries. Uh, and and, uh, and they, were, they were indeed booming. Uh, but, but relative to the Eurozone, Germany was the important thing. Germany is the main economy in the Eurozone, and therefore the, the very dominant economy in terms of how to set monetary parameters, so to speak. So monetary policy had to be relatively accommodative, easy uh, in, in during that period. And that was okay for Germany. And Germany indeed 
uh, recovered due to, to, to this, but also due to structural reforms, I, I should add, uh, on the labor market that, that have been helpful. Uh, and and in, in the meanwhile, a, a countries like Spain and, and Greece are growing uh, uh, very rapidly, indeed too rapidly with visible in, in, in fairly strong money supply growth, it was visible in, in relatively buoyant normal demand growth, and it was visible in increasing the external imbalances that, 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 uh, that's a, a way to spot whether demand grows faster than supply in, in, in a small open economy is, is visible on, on, on the current account situation. So indeed, it was it's, it's pretty clear that monetary policy was probably becoming too easy. Uh, I'm tempted to say that there were signs of a, a Austrian school kind of boom in parts of Europe in, in, in that period. Indeed, I wrote about it back in 2006, seven, uh, regarding Central Eastern Europe, warning, for example, of uh, a boom bust risks in, in, in the politics. And what happened there was very much positive supply shocks, uh, shocks what, what Austrian school economists call uh, relative inflation. You couldn't see the headline inflation, um, but because of uh, positive supply shocks, uh, inflation was kept down, but demand was very buoyant. Uh, and uh, and that created imbalances and then un- eventually had to unbind. And as that started, we then were hit by a global, very strong negative demand shock, which is very visible for, 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 for the so-called pigs, Portugal, Italy, Ireland, Greece, and Spain, but also for the Baltic, uh, who of course at that time was outside of the euro area, but had to the euro, it was visible for Romania, Bulgaria, uh, that, that went through this. And contrary to this, of course, the countries in Europe were floating exchange rates. Sweden, for example, Poland, Czech Republic, Hungary, um, that also was hit by a shot in 2008, but because of monetary policy flexibility and indeed monetary policy sovereignty, they controlled their own monetary policy, were able to allow their currencies to even cut interest rates and allow monetary conditions to ease to offset the shock that came from the global crisis. And, and, and I, I like to highlight uh, the, uh, the performance of, for example, my own country, Denmark, which is not a euro member, but is pegged to the euro. Mm-hmm. Uh, Denmark haven't seen any economic growth essentially since 2007. Uh, there are obviously structural problems, but very much so the peg exchange has played a huge role in having too tight monetary conditions. If we compare Denmark to neighboring Sweden, Sweden has fully recovered. Indeed, it's growing fairly strongly now, and one could argue that, that we're getting close to a situation where Sweden ought to begin to tighten monetary conditions, at least if you use the metrics the two of us would like to look at nominal, nominal GDP growth, um, then, then, then uh, it's, it's, it's very striking. Of course, the most extreme example of this is, is the country I started uh, a great deal, uh, namely uh, Iceland. Iceland, of course, have a floating exchange rate and went into this dramatic banking crisis in 2008 uh, uh, where the entire Icelandic banking sector collapsed. Uh, the international parts of the banks uh, indeed defaulted, and the Icelandic government was very close to a uh, sovereign default. Um, the uh, currency then collapsed. Uh, the uh, central bank reacted by slashing interest rates, uh, and uh, after after uh, some some uh, after quite deep recession, a recovery started in, in mid 2010, and indeed since then has been very strong. And 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 uh, Iceland is fully recovered from the crisis indeed. Uh, if we look at uh, real GDP, uh, the most successful uh, recovery among the Nordic states, uh, meaning Finland, Denmark, Norway, Sweden, and Iceland, then Iceland is indeed the country that has done the best. Uh, with just a head up of Sweden, guess what? The two floaters among the five, Norway is also a floating country, but Iceland and uh, Finland, which is in the euro, and Denmark, which is pegged to the euro, uh, are, are still... In, in prolonged crisis. And I think it's very hard to get around that this relative performance of the five Nordic countries is very much a monetary question. So just to be clear, you mentioned earlier that your country, Denmark, has not done well because it pegs to the euro. So for the listeners who, who are making the connection, that they effectively import the ECB's monetary policy. Given there's capital flows um, and they peg, then they are doing whatever the ECB tells them to do. Now, Going back to this point again about you know the one size fits all monetary policy. So prior to two thousand eight, what you're saying is that the periphery, all the countries down that are you know Spain, Portugal, Italy, 
um, Ireland, uh, all those countries in the periphery, they got monetary policy that was too accommodative, too easy for them, while it was more catered towards Germany during the, the, the pre-2008 period. But what you're saying is afterwards, it flipped the other direction, right? So it became effectively too tight for them. And so you, either way, they, they can't win. Is that what I'm hearing? Absolutely. And, and it, it, it was working out fairly okay as long as we had growth. Um, having slightly too strong growth, the signs of overheating in that period didn't create much tension. It didn't create financial disturbances. But on the downside, of course, it becomes much worse because when, when you have, have negative growth for a prolonged period, you very fast run into uh, public finance problems. And uh, once you run into public finance problems, you get uh, financial distress. And what we foresee is that we have weak nominal demand growth, very weak nominal GDP growth. And as a result of that, it's very hard to service your public debt, even when interest rates are very low, as is the case in, in Europe at the moment. Uh, so, and, and, and I think it's, it's, it's very interesting in that regard to look at the development in public debt across the Eurozone countries. Um, it's often said, and it's, 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 it's a misunderstanding, that Greece hasn't done anything on the public uh, public finances. Indeed, Greece has tightened fiscal policy very dramatically since 2010. Uh, uh, if you look at the accumulated change in the structural budget deficit, the tightening of fiscal policy in Greece is it of the magnitude of 20% of GDP. This is indeed one of the largest uh, fiscal consolidation in history. Uh, in any uh, uh, developed nation in the world. Uh, and despite of that, that a share of GDP has just continued to rise. And this is because uh, GDP has collapsed. Mm -hmm. So, uh, the, you know, it, 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 it's impossible to, uh, to do enough fiscal tightening to get out of this crisis. I'm not arguing here that this is a Keynesian crisis. It's not the fact that we have fiscal tightening in itself that is causing the crisis is the monetary uh, causes of the crisis, but it's impossible to uh, consolidate public finance when there's no growth in the economy. And, right. and indeed, in this, in, in this connection, it's also interesting that particularly in 2010, 11, 12, the ECB, uh, uh, to a very large extent, uh, made a direct connection between the willingness to ease monetary policy uh, and, and political development. So uh, the ECB more or less said, unless you uh, elect pro-fiscally conservative governments in Greece and Italy, we will not ease monetary policy in Europe. And, and, and the interesting thing about that is political events in itself became monetary policy. Let me give you an example, and this very much comes in line with, with market monetary thinking. If I say I'm the ECB and I say, if you elect uh, a non-fiscally conservative prime minister in Italy, we will hike interest rates. The market will look at opinion polls and see that the non-reformist politician is gaining in the opinion polls, meaning the likelihood of monetary tightening increases. The market will then price that in already now and therefore effectively tighten monetary policy. And therefore we have that paradoxical situation that our opinion polls in itself in that period, 2010, 11, 12, became monetary policy. And I think that is one of the contributions of market monetarism is how uh, key market expectations are. And we really cannot just sit around and looking at what interest rate the central bank is setting, but we have to, to put it into the perspective of what is the expectation of future market, uh, of future monetary policy conditions, and and what what policy rule uh, is is the given central bank following? So you're saying during that time, the ECB signaled it wouldn't adjust the stance of monetary policy unless fiscally reform-minded individuals were elected. Are, are are you saying like bailouts or actual like adjusting of interest rates and QE? Well, I think that that is another problem is that, that um, uh, you and I very well know the difference between uh, credit, uh, credit policies and monetary policy because uh -huh. we read Lila and Yeager, so we know uh, the difference between the two. Uh, I think that from the onset of this crisis, both in the U.S. and Europe, 
there has been a it's been a huge problem for central bank and indeed for most economists to figure out the difference between monetary policy and 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 credit policy. Credit policy is just essentially a form of of a fiscal policy conducted with the help of central banks. Uh, it's not about money creation, but it's more about uh, di- distorting uh, markets uh, and giving subsidies to, uh, to 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 certain players in the market. And that would be, for example, uh, a bailout. Uh, so you're speaking of bailouts when you say when you're saying that the, when the market was you know seeing whether the right person has been elected, they were using that to price in you know whether there'd be a bailout or not. Is that is that what you're saying? No, it, it was it was pricing in whether the ECB would be so tight in monetary policy. Uh, it might have had a view also on, on whether they would pay bailouts okay. or not. But so you're saying actual it, actual policy setting too. Yes, well, that's interesting. I didn't realize that. It's very interesting. Very very clear in in, in the rhetoric. Okay. Uh, 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 and huh. and uh, Scott Sumner uh, uh, at, at at one time something that inspired me very much, and of course something that is very uh, uh, visible in such a new book. Uh, the uh, meet, meet as a paradox uh, is um, is that in the 1930s, uh, you know, politics kept on showing up in the financial pages, and I think uh, I have used that reference quite quite a bit uh, in regards to what is going on in Europe, uh, because uh, there was such a politicization of monetary policy, not that only that politicians were pressuring the ECB, but also that the ECB was pressuring politicians. So there was this, I would say, uh, a collusion between the Eurocrats and the uh, ECB bureaucrats uh, to push for a certain policy agenda. And, and some of it was quite irrational, uh, to me very much driven by anger among policymakers in, in, in Europe, in Frankfurt with the ECB and in Brussels, the EU, uh, uh, that that uh, that countries like Greece have been let, let off the hook historically. Obviously, we know that Greece lied about its statistics, uh, uh, and, and we have a number of, of examples of this. And when crisis then hit, uh, there was a you know now we're going to get them, and it was it 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 it, 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 it you know I would say rather childish behavior on the part of policymakers in 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 Europe in in, in, in key policy institutions in Europe. Uh, and 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 so you you get very much driven by who is elected. And just take now, I'm, 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 if you look at what is happening in Europe, and I'm actually worried about this, is that we are seeing in Europe now that because of the refugee crisis, uh, among other things, uh, where Europe, uh, the, where, where Germany has played a, a a role of being relatively liberal on immigration policy and has accepted. Uh, a lot of, of of Syrian refugees. Uh, we have seen increased support uh, in in Germany for the Alternative for Deutschland, which is a populist right-wing party, uh, very strong like anti-immigration, but also anti-Euro. And uh, uh, Alternative for Deutschland is now pressuring the center-right government in Germany from the right on immigration policy, but indeed also on the Euro and on 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 what is perceived in Germany as letting. Uh, the Southern Europeans off the hook. So what is happening now is that recently uh, 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 Scheibel, the German Minister of Finance from 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 the CDU, the center right governing party in Germany, has uh, uh, you know re- renewed his attack on the ECB for having sweet monetary policies in years. So now there's a direct connection with internal political discussion in Europe. And and Scheibel's calls, the German government calls for, you know, ending monetary accommodation. So imagine now we are beginning to see growth uh, soften again in Southern Europe. And this is indeed what we are seeing. And as a result of that, we're also beginning to see now the Spanish, the Portuguese, the Italian government all coming out and saying, you know, our fiscal target for 2016 and 2017, we are unlikely to meet them. Uh, we'll have to run back to the EU and say, you know, we, we cannot do that. The EU will then say, you need to do more fiscal authority and say, we cannot do that. We have no uh, support for that in our population. And at the same time, we then have a German government that is becoming, uh, you know, is being pushed by, by anti-immigration forces to mm-hmm. do something, to look tough. Uh, and the way they have to look tough is to, uh, to call for the ECB to end fiscal intake. And so you get this, 
uh, uh, the politics of Europe in itself becomes a, mon- becomes a monetary program. Poison, yeah, poisons the monetary policy process. Absolutely, absolutely. So, I think I, if you go back to, 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 to really go back, and I think something we all miss is, is, is John Stuart Mill talked about mm-hmm. the monetary re- re- machinery. When the monetary machinery works, it, nobody talks about it. When, it. when it's not working, and it's not working in Europe, then we are seeing all these problems that we're seeing now in Europe. You know, the challenge is, is that many people don't don't identify it as a monetary problem, right? They'll identify it as a structural problem, as an immigrant problem, as a us versus them problem. So it's it's incumbent upon the you know the leaders and the the economists to make sure they get this proper message out. Now, I, I want to go back to the point you raised earlier about the ECB. Um, the issue is, in my mind, you know, the issue at the end of the day, it, it all boils down to, you know, the eurozone was never well designed from the get go, and there are a number of economists who said, be careful. In fact, Martin Feldstein, in a foreign affairs article, I believe ninety eight, ninety seven, argued there might be even war in Europe at some point over this. Um, but I think what you've argued that is, in addition to the fact that the eurozone is not an optimal currency area, you can exacerbate it with bad policy. So, for example, we talked about the ECB raising interest rates in 2008 and 2011 when they were faced with these inflation shocks, the very same ones that the U.S. saw. The U.S. also saw these concerns, but the U.S. acted differently. Maybe not ideal, but they acted differently. Um, why is it? What is it about the ECB that that caused them to tighten and not the Fed? I mean, the, the Fed, I guess, interpreted these inflation shocks as temporary, as commodity prices. So, why does the ECB have such a inflation hawkish bias to it? Well, I think I think one of the things is, of course, the ECB is a young uh, young institution. Okay. Um, it's it, it's also an institution where you have surprising a little monetary insight. Uh, that 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 could seem paradoxical ah. for, uh, for 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 uh, 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 central bank, but if you look at the the the, the, the uh, ECB's executive board, you have a lot of people who are essentially politicians rather than than monetary economists, which is is in stark contrast to 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 to. Uh, to the U.S. and other thing I think is, is very important um, uh, uh, is a real strength of the U.S. system is the diversity of opinions in, in the U.S. Mm-hmm. That you actually have people who, who would stand up and say, "I'm an Austrian school economist. I'm a monetarist. I'm a market monetarist. I'm a Keynesian. I'm I'm a post Keynesian. I have all, there's all kinds of diverging views." Uh, 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 you know, the number of participants in a typical FOMC meeting is somewhere between 60 and 80 participants when we not only look at the FOMC members, but also look about different inter- experts that are brought in. Mm-hmm. So it's a very, you can say it's, it's an argumentary process, it's a, but it's, it's after all, there is some learning uh, uh, in, in, in the Fed. Uh, you know, both you and I have been very critical about how the Fed has been conducting monetary policy, and it's n- most definitely not been perfect. But it has been gradually inching in the right direction uh, mm-hmm. under the leadership of Ben Bernanke. I would say we have taken a turn for the worst uh, since Janet Yellen became chair of the Fed. But you can't say that for the ECB. There seems to be no learning, and there seems to be a lot of of you know the fact that this is, Europe is not a country. The fact that we, we uh, you know, it, it's not so that when Rob, Robert Kaplan, the, the, the chairman, the, the, the president of the Dallas Fed, votes on the, on, on, the, uh, on the FOMC, he's not sitting and looking at Texas and saying, how well is Texas doing? I ought to vote for Texas. He's looking at, at, at the, uh, the entire economy in the same way as uh, the, uh, Jeff Lager, uh, from Richmond Fed, it's not sitting and looking at the Richmond area and saying, "Oh, mm-hmm. Richmond is doing bad, or Richmond is doing good." You no, know, they tend to look at the, the entire U.S. economy. While in the eurozone, it's actually very much driven by national interest, and then it's also driven by a political positioning um, that we have to show that we are a strong, independent nation. We will not cave in to political pressures. And the paradox is here that the ECB have caved in to all kinds of political pressures. They have done all kinds of horrible bailout policies they have participated in, uh, distorting bond markets uh, 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 um, and, 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 and participated in all kinds of actions 
then increasing moral asset forms. The only thing they haven't done is done real monetary thing. So they've done a lot of credit policy. Uh, but what would they expect? It's, it, it, it's very much driven by political rather than monetary economical considerations. That's interesting because if you look at the German economy, it did relatively well you know, after it, the Great Recession bottomed out, right? So its unemployment rate failed relatively low. It grew rapidly. So there was no sense of urgency on the Germans' part to engage in something like QE or any kind of stimulus program, where in the rest of the Eurozone, on the periphery, definitely there was the need. So it is interesting you, you mentioned each country looks out for their own interests more so than in the regional Fed presidents do in the U.S., yeah, and absolutely. so, so you know, had Germany been more like you know Robert Kaplan or Lacker, um, they would have been pushing for QE sooner, I, I imagine, or for more monetary. They definitely would have been pushing for the interest rate hikes in 2011. Um, yeah, well, maybe, maybe, maybe Rob and, and, and Jeff are <laughs> right. good examples in that direction. But yeah, uh, but, but yeah, it's it, it, yeah, yeah, they 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 they. they uh, well, there'd they, be sure, sure, to be the case, and I, I do think there is a. There is a parallel to um, to to the Great Depression and and uh, the actions of the Federal Reserve System, uh, because similarly uh, during the Great uh, Depression, the Fed was a very young central bank. Uh, hmm. The uh, correct me if I'm wrong. The Fed was established in 1913. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so it was quite young when when the crisis hit. And at that time, it was it was very much a regionally based uh, central bank, much more so than today. Today, the uh, Fed regions is, is more about uh, maintaining jobs for certain people, and uh, and and uh, but but it, it it is a it is one central bank thinking overall mm-hmm. in one way. At least it comes to a collective wisdom of some kind. Uh, contrary to 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 the the end, just just imagine being a central bank governor in Greece. You know, the thirty percent unemployment, uh, uh, a seven year long depression. Uh, continuous deflationary pressures, and you can see that the government is continuing to struggle with public finance problems. So even though they're tightening this problem diplomatically, it's just getting worse and worse. And you have the rise of uh, neo Nazism, and you have the, you know, now the governing party, Syriza, that has been in power for more than a year, is indeed an a, a extremist left wing party. Uh, and you're sitting there, and you can see at the core of this, you know that the country needs dramatic monetary easing. And then you go to Germany and say, what are you talking about? The economy is doing fine. You know, growth is, is strong. Uh, the only complaint we have is pensioners saying interest rates are too low, so we don't get any, any return on our pension savings. This is a mm-hmm. the, the typical German uh, debate. Uh, it, interest rates are too low, uh, so, so we don't have any returns on our pension savings. Um, uh, it's a complete bogus debate, of course, but, but this, this you'll see the, the divergence. And then there is the... Um, then there is undoubtedly also some cultural issues in place here. Uh, there is a perception in Northern Europe um, that that the, the, the Southern Europeans are lazy and they're lying and they're corrupt and they're not, you know, doing that job properly. And and here, you know, I think the example of, of Finland is 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 very good. Um, when I used to be in in Danske Bank, which is of course one of the largest lenders in in the Nordic region. Uh, I, I spent quite a bit of time in, in Finland. If you go back to, to 2010, if you were in Finland and talking to Finns, they would, uh, at that time, Finland was just in the midst of the crisis of everybody else, but not doing particularly worse. The Finland didn't have massive uh, public finance problems because Finland, going into it, had quite healthy public finances. Uh, so the Finns didn't feel particularly hard hit by the crisis other than you know, compared to anybody else. But the Finns are very eager to tell everybody that those uh, lazy Southern Europeans, they should just do as we did in the 1990s, do fiscal reform, tighten the belt, do uh, proper structural reforms. And, uh, and I remember telling uh, a Finnish client and Finnish colleagues back then, you know, you didn't really do uh, 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 a lot of fiscal reform. You didn't really do uh, a lot of uh, structural reforms. What happened in Finland in the 90s, was a massive devaluation of the Finnish market before joining the euro. So you had monetary stimulus to take you out of the crisis. And you actually still have very su- substantial structural problems, particularly in the labor market. And people ignore that in Finland. And now you're actually seeing that Finland is, is beginning to look like a sovereign European country. Seven years with no growth. Uh, and, and, and now it's beginning to hurt. And Finland, of course, used to be a AAA-rated nation, but has been downgraded. Uh, 
uh, because of increasing public finance problems. Uh, and, so and so you have these cultural things that the Finn, the average Finn would say, oh, these horrible Southern mm-hmm. Europeans are not doing anything. And I'm sure if you ask an average European or, or average Northern European, a Dane, a Swede, a Finn, a Dutch or German, what do you think about Greek fiscal policy? Or sorry, they're not doing anything. While in fact, the Greeks have tightened fiscal policy very, very dramatically. They just haven't got the right outcome. Well, that, uh, that, that, that attitude, you know, those cultural differences, you know, suggest to me that, it's, that this currency union's days are numbered, right? To really make it successful, you're going to have to get big fiscal transfers, increase labor mobility. And what you're suggesting is that's not very likely going to happen, um, given these, these attitudes. But let's, let's move on um, in the time we have left here. We're going to go from one currency area that's not optimal, the Eurozone, to another one that you've written about and spoke about many times, and that is the dollar block. So the dollar block would be all those countries that either use the dollar explicitly or they peg to it one way or the other. And the dollar block is the biggest currency union of sorts in the world. And uh, you've written about it that it's been destabilizing lately. So tell us about that. Yeah, I think I think what is interesting is that, um, you know, we if we look at monetary development over time, it, it's really been uh, the gradual success of Milton Friedman. Milton Friedman, of course, was an added supporter of floating exchange rates. I'm very skeptical about pegged exchange rate on uh, and 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 there's a freedom of success uh, in 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 freeing up uh, currencies. Really started in 1971 when President Nixon uh, uh, closed the so-called gold window and effectively ended the uh, the Bretton Woods uh, system. And of course, that started a period of somewhat uh, uh, you know of, of you know uh, pegged exchange rate regimes falling apart. At that time, essentially global pegged exchange rate regime. Then in Europe, we have tried to put together pack exchange rate regimes. We, we, uh, we, we first had the so-called snake, and then we have the European exchange rate mechanism, and now, of course, we have the euro. Uh, but in, 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 during that period, uh, a number of countries have fallen out of the now floating currencies, Switzerland, Sweden, Norway, Poland, and so forth, have floating exchange rates. And then, you know, if you go continue that in, 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 in 1997, we had the, uh, we had uh, uh, the Asian crisis, of course, uh, with countries like Malaysia, uh, Thailand, South Korea giving up their pegs to the dollar, except essentially leaving the dollar block. So we've had this gradual process moving from one unified monetary policy globally, essentially, in the bread and wood, to more and more countries having floating exchange rates. And, I, you know, I think underlying that's a very positive tendency, but the problem is it's not happening in an orderly fashion, it's not happening in disorderly fashion. But there has been, as you said, the dollar block still exists. Uh, of course, the, the, the major players in the dollar block uh, is China and the U.S. The U.S., of course, being the dollar uh, creator. But, you know, essentially, uh, 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 for, for a very long time, the Chinese remember has been pegged to the dollar. Of course, that peg has been uh, loosened uh, since 2005, gradually, first in, in towards a strong strengthening of the remember, and then recently for weakening of the remember against the dollar. But still, the, the Chinese monetary authority has been shattering the dollar. So that's been still a, a quite a strong link between the dollar and the remember. So the two largest countries in the world essentially is following the same monetary policy patterns. So when the U.S. is tightening monetary policy, China via the exchange rate policy is importing that. And given China is doing that, it's also having dramatic impact on, for example, of commodity prices. And then if you go to another member of that dollar block, looking at all of the Gulf states, so large, largest among them, of course, Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia had a peg to the dollar since 1986. So when China is tightening monetary policy and the U.S. is tightening monetary policy, uh, the dollar is strengthening, but so is the Saudi real. Uh, and and for, for Saudi Arabia, the oil price is also declining, so it's giving double whammy. So so China and the U.S. together is determining monetary policy for Saudi Arabia. Of course, that is creating a lot of tension for Saudi Arabia. The mm-hmm. same goes for Hong Kong, where we have seen uh, the import of monetary conditions. The same goes for 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 uh, for a number of emerging markets. Another example could be be Angola. And what we have seen in the past two to three years is 
that we got gradual move away from this. We have seen, particularly among the commodity exporters, countries like Angola, as I mentioned, but also uh, 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 Azerbaijan, uh, Kazakhstan, that used to have their currencies pegged to the dollar until recently, have been forced to give up the peg because they have imported tighter monetary conditions ever since the Fed uh, started signaling rate hikes now nearly two years ago when the dollar started strengthening. So a country like Kazakhstan or Azerbaijan was importing tighter monetary conditions. But since they were exporting oil, which was plummeting, they really needed uh, uh, easier monetary policy rather than tighter monetary policy. And here, of course, the parallel to the Eurozone is very clear. Uh, 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 we have a situation where in the Eurozone you have Germany needing tighter monetary conditions, or at least not easier, and then you have Greece on the other hand. But you would take in the dollar block, the U.S. needing uh, at least to, you know, in Fed lingo, normalize monetary conditions, uh, while a country like Saudi Arabia would need easier monetary conditions. But because they're in the same monetary union, uh, essentially, uh, uh, that's not possible, and then creates then. Uh, uh, imbalances in the economic development. And I think that, that that is creating these tensions in the dollar block, and we have seen that. And, and I do think that we are, it's, it's a period where more and more countries gradually will let go of their, so, their close relationship to the dollar. So more it's, countries, it's are, so more countries are, are slowly peeling off the dollar block, but there's still enough to, to make a difference. And, and it's, you know, it's, it's sobering if, if you're a Fed official when you sit down and you vote on U.S. monetary policy to think to ponder that your decision is not just affecting the U.S., and that is their domestic mandate. That's their mandate. They, they're not supposed to think you know, about China or Saudi Arabia, but really they're setting monetary policy for a good portion of the world economy. Um, it, it's, just, it's kind of a mind-blowing thought, right? The Fed makes a decision. It affects some poor person in Saudi Arabia or in China or Angola, as you mentioned. And what's, yeah. b- what's and, been— fa- and, 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 Go ahead. Yeah. Now the interesting thing in that is that not only for these countries that are that, that are directly pegged to to uh, to the dollar, but indeed for countries, a lot of emerging market countries where monetary policy uh, 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 maturity, where you don't have a lot of maturity in monetary policy uh, decisions, where you uh, have, have have policymakers who essentially is conducting monetary policy by letting their currency shadow the dollar. So. It's like, oh, our currency is weakening vis-a-vis the dollar, then monetary policy has become too easy. Mm-hmm. So they, they use that as their anger. So you can say there are peripheral uh, 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 dollar per countries, and that is you know, a the very, dirty, very large part of the, of the emerging market currency. The, country. the, dirty, and, and then of the course, dirty peggers, they loosely Yeah, exactly. All of, they, they, yeah. The, the dirty peggers and... and, and, and and there, I, I think, commodity price prices also plays a huge role. Uh, uh, we, we, have had a, we have had a discussion. Uh, if, if you follow the debate about what happens in, in, with oil prices, uh, and both you and I have written about it, that, that we think that the reasons given for the drop in oil prices is all wrong. It's not about supply side issues. It's not about Saudi Arabia uh, uh, wanting oil prices to be low or, 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 or sanctions being lifted against it. No, this is about... Uh, the dollar block tightening monetary policy. If you look at it, uh, dollar, global dollar nominal GDP, it has declined dramatically uh, in the past two years. In fact, if you look at nominal GDP on a global basis in dollar terms, the contraction is more or less in the same scale as 2008. So it's no surprise that commodity prices are declining. Mm-hmm. But if you're a commodity exporting country, which is shadowing the dollar, you are getting that right in the nose. Yep. Uh, and, 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 and of course, uh, that is why a country like Kazakhstan eventually has to throw in the towel and let the currency flow. Uh, now, real, enough, real quick, they, they were for the last few minutes, I, I'm going to suggest a scenario to you and you just tell me what you think briefly. We only got a few minutes left. Um, so my view has been that since mid-2014, when the Fed started talking up interest rates, that caused the dollar to appreciate. In fact, the dollar appreciated 20% since then. And it's come down a little bit when the Fed's, Fed has pulled back. But the dollar itself is a pre- trade-weighted dollar is about 20%, which has pulled up all of these, these either explicit peggers or dirty peggers, as you mentioned. And that is causing global demand to slow down because they've imported this tightening. And that is what you've suggested is affecting to, at least some part of the price for oil. Now, like Ben Bernanke on one of his blogs recently estimated that 
about 40 to 45 percent of decline in oil prices since mid 2014 can be tied to weakening global aggregate demand. So what you're the story you're telling me, just to be clear, is that this is tied to the Fed's tightening and its effect via the dollar block countries. Is that right? Oh yeah, I, I very strongly think so. That the uh, a very large part of the demand axis in the global commodity prices is is effectively uh, uh, caused by 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 the tightening of monetary conditions in the dollar block. And now we are, of course, going full circle. What is market monetarism? The market is telling us, the commodity market is telling us that monetary type monetary conditions globally through the what I believe you invented the term a monetary global monetary superpowers, the Federal Reserve and the People's Bank of China, they are tightening monetary conditions and market prices. The price of oil is telling us that. Mm. The dollar is telling us that. The yield curve is telling us that. Market expectations for inflation is telling us that. And 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 that is why we had so meager growth in the US in the first quarter. Uh, it seems like Q2 is slightly better. But, but, but I, I continue to think it's, it's very odd that the Fed still talks about essentially hiking interest rates in a situation where, where the obvious um, monetary conditions is tightening rather than easing, uh, uh, and, and, and we, uh, we, we are having quite weak nominal demand growth. And, and uh, you know, I would favor uh, at the presently uh, that, we, uh, that we, the Fed should just target 4% nominal GDP growth from present levels. Mm-hmm. And this is indeed what Ben Bernanke said was doing from essentially 2010 and onwards. Uh, but if you look at that uh, very nice 4% trend growth in, in nominal GDP, we have been uh, now consistently for, uh, for, for, for a year or so falling below that. And I think that there has been a change in, in monetary policy on the general in that direction. Well, Lars, we are out of time. We thank you so much for being on the show. Our guest today has been Lars Christensen. Lars, thank you. Thank you. Macro Musings is produced by the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. If you haven't already, please subscribe via iTunes or your favorite podcast app. And while you're there, please consider rating us and leaving a review. This helps other thoughtful people like you find the podcast. Thanks for listening.